Good evening. Um, thank you for joining us at the 10th anniversary of Ryerson Social Justice Week. My name is Kike Roach and I am the Unifor Chair in Social Justice and Democracy here at Ryerson. And um, we are very pleased that you could join us this evening for food justice in a time of COVID. And we're really pleased to bring you this session that has been organized by the Continuing Education Students Association at Ryerson. Um, to put on Social Justice Week takes the work of many people. And so I wanna say a big thank you to uh, first, the woman who founded it all, Dr. Winnie Ng, who was my predecessor in this chair. We wanna thank our principal sponsors, um, the Faculty of Arts and the Faculty of Community Services, as well as all of our other sponsors for the week. We also wanna thank the ASL team from Toronto Sign Language Interpreters. Um, on the scene right on the screen right now, you see Marcia, and she's going to be joined by Joanne as well. We want to thank our captioning team, um, which is led tonight by Michelle, and also our tech team. Um, we have Ayat helping us out. Um, we also want to thank our communications team for getting the word out, um, Julia Davidova and Noshin Kayum. And I want to say a very special thank you to Salman Khan who's been with Social Justice Week for the past 10 years. And we've relied on his excellent work year after year and we're really grateful um, to be able to work with him. Um, of course, uh, I wanna say a big thank you to Cesar um, and its whole executive team and staff team, um, in particular, Corey Scott and Carol Sutherland who was so instrumental in bringing this um, session together today and also um, has sat on our Social Justice Week planning committees for years now and helped us um, in so many different ways. And of course, um, to Janet Rodriguez, who is also a veteran Social Justice Week planning committee member who's been really um, instrumental in advising us in so many different ways. And we um, were grateful for her support over the years as well. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Janet Rodriguez, president of CESAR. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 10th annual Social Justice Week. Uh, my name is Janet Rodriguez. I use she and her pronouns, and I am the uh, elected president at the Continuing Education Students Association of Ryerson, CESAR for short. Before we continue, I would like to um, acknowledge that we can never work to end systematic and institutional violence if we do not center the narratives of indigenous peoples in our collective decision-making for social justice and equity. As settlers in Turtle Island, we directly benefit from the colonization and genocide of the indigenous people of this land. In order to engage in resistance and solidarity against the injustices inflicted on the indigenous people, it is imperative we constantly engage in acts of decolonization. Toronto and Ryerson University are in the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land, as well as subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. We understand that through this virtual space, many of us may not necessarily be in Toronto, but somewhere else. So we encourage you to look up uh, the name of the territory in whichever city you're located in. You can go to native-land.ca and someone is going to be very kind to actually put it on the, on the um, chat box. Uh, it, it would be very important for you to educate yourself and, and there's so many information around in Google. Uh, 
I just wanted to uh, renew the thanks to the ASL interpreters, all the folks who have been organizing Social Justice Week. And uh, CESA represents continuing education students, part-time students, and um, certificate students. And we are the second student union on the campus of Ryerson. So the Social Justice Week this year is beyond walls, beyond borders. And we're going to start the session on food justice in a time of COVID. And the moderator for this session is Hansel Igbavoa. Let me tell you a little bit about Hansel. Hansel is a creative entrepreneur, photographer, and filmmaker whose work is steeped in social innovation, storytelling, and community building and activism. His work seeks to challenge and shift paradigms of social, economic, and political structures and systems, as well as truth and traditions through visual conversations and innovation of beauty, normalcy, culture, identity, sovereignty, liberation, and power. He employs academic research to unearth knowledge and pulls from his lived experiences to create the basis to which his art is imagined. Hansel is currently studying entrepreneurship and strategy at Ryerson University, where he was the recipient of the inaugural Isaac Olawulafe Digital Media Experience Creators Grant, and most recently awarded with the Dean's Award for Social Innovation. He also participated in Awaken Sankofa, an international artist residency program in Ghana, a collaboration between the Kwame Nkrumah Pan-African Center and Ryerson University curated by Mark V. Campbell and the Nisha Prendergast. I'm gonna leave you in the very capable and artistic hands of Hansel Igbavoa. Thank you very much, Janet. Um, hello everyone and welcome um, to Food Justice in a Time of COVID. I'm really happy to be moderating this conversation. I'm excited for um, what is to come and, 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 and you know, the gems that will come out of tonight. Um, before we go on, I will just introduce um, all our panelists for today and we'll just jump right into the conversation. Um, so in no particular order, um, tonight with us, we have Tracy Ann Hines. Tracy Ann is a former migrant worker. She has been an active member of Justice for Migrant Workers for the past five years. Tracy Ann has organized with others to fight for justice for injured workers. She has also participated in numerous community forums and panel discussions at George Brown College, Toronto College, and, and the University of Ottawa, among others, about the intersection between gender and migration. We also have tonight Dr. Roberta K. Timothy. Dr. Timothy is the Director of Health Promotion at the Dalla School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. She specializes in the areas of intersectionality and ethics in health work, um, health and race, transnational indigenous health and anti-oppression, anti-colonial approaches to mental health. Dr. Timothy prioritizes critical and creative approaches um, to knowledge production that reflect experiences and aspirations of migrant, refugee, African and black diasporic and transnational indigenous communities. She has extensive teaching experience with particular expertise in critical health theory and social justice health policy development and implementation. Her scholarship contributes to critical race theory by examining how factors such as gender, class, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, transgenerational connections, and historical and contemporary intersectional violence impact African and Black communities' health and by centering community resistance through innovative decolonizing health practices. 
Dr. Timothy is also co-founder and consultant of um, consultant at Continuing Healing Consultants, where she implements and teaches her intersectional mental health model, anti-oppression psychotherapy. She is an interdisciplinary scholar and health pr practitioner who is also a political scientist who examines global health and ethics from a critical trauma-informed decolonizing framework. We also have tonight Suraya Ibrahim. Suraya Ibrahim is a supervisor of community connections at the Center for Community Learning and Development. She is co-founder of Mother of Peace and has been featured on CBC Radio, CBC Television, and in the New York Times. She has been involved in many community development projects, including the Regent Park Catering Collective, which has catered for more than 300 events and created income generating opportunities for over 65 Regent Park residents. Originally from Ethiopia, she has lived, volunteered and worked with community in Regent Park in Toronto for many years ever since, volunteering, studying and working in the community. She is honored with she was honored with numerous awards, including Women Who Inspires Award from the Canadian Council of Muslim Women, Distinguished Service Award from the Muslim Association of Canada, the Phenomenal Woman Award, the Jane Jacobs Prize, Victims and Victim Services from the Attorney General, Bayani Family Foundation Awards from United Way, and Community Champions Award from CBC. So help us welcome our panelists for tonight. Okay, so I'm going to jump right into the first question. So our first question here tonight is, millions of people lack food security, some intermittently due to varying degrees of poverty. Can you use some examples of how this pandemic is widening the gap? What barriers does COVID-19 present to how community members have access to food? How does it play out in their mental and physical health? And we can have anyone go first in this question. Roberta, do you want to maybe start off? Uh, hey, us off in this <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Hansel. Um, I just want to do a, a locate myself before I, I um, answer the question. And I want to just thank, thank you um, to Carol Sutherland, Sutherland, a Black activist working for Black Workers Matter, and all the social justice warriors, KK Roach, and committee members for inviting me to speak on this amazing panel. I want to also honor the 10th year anniversary of Social Justice Week at Ryerson as we continue to dismantle and disrupt colonial violence locally and transnationally. I worked as Ry at Ryerson as a young Black woman scholar living with a disability. The experience of anti-Black racism and other violence while teaching at 26 years old changed my trajectory in, which, in regards to working at university. I recently re returned to working in the academy. I want to recognize the Black staff, students, faculty, and community members who have experienced anti-Black racism and lynching at Ryerson and other educational plantations. And I stand with you as we continue to resist against all forms of anti-Black anti-Indigenous, white supremacy, and intersectional violence in the halls of these institutions. Let us never let tenure, promotion, or whitelisting stop us from refuting and denouncing violence. I really need to say that before I started. Um, I also want to identify myself in terms of food, food violence or food insecurities. My working class roots not coming from generational money ground me in this conversation as I recently paid off my student loans. I'm a person living with a disability who has had, who's had precarious work, even with a PhD, Living on a permanent budget was an act of magic sometimes, often requiring the support of my sole parent mother. She came here at the age of 21 as a domestic in the 60s and went back to school at age 40 with four children, battling food insecurity with fierceness and a bag of rice and beans. Even then, still sending barrels and money home to help the family dealing with food insecurities. This taught me that resistance against the legacy of food violence in our communities is inevitable. Being working class means continuously working real hard, many jobs, and not having enough money to live. However, families do live and do raise children and do achieve amazingness even through their struggles. I'm a living example of this and there are many others. So food insecurity and food violence is inherently connected to colonialism, which is connected to keeping the colonized impoverished. Therefore, keeping millions of folks food insecure is critical 
in upholding our capitalist and white supremacist systems. The impoverishing of colonized nations and peoples has been happening for over 400 years. And this has been done through different mechanisms of food deprivation or food violence by essentially stealing people from their lands, transatlantic slave trade, and the creation of Indian reserves and forcing African indigenous peoples to create food surpluses for European peoples and their nations, utilizing our, neighbor and our labor and our food. So before the COVID-19 pandemic, food insecurity was widespread. In 2018, 2019, there was over 1 million reported visits to a food bank in Canada. And again, these numbers leave out the fact that there are many ways in which food violence stats are not counted. There are many who are living through food insecurity who do not count. For instance, there are many people who share or split their groceries based on food violence. There are many who are working three to four jobs to put food on the table. There are people who are living in fancy homes who don't eat every day. Our notion of poverty is influenced by our mainstream media's depiction of the impoverished, who's always black or racialized, a single mother, sole parent, on assistance, who quote unquote is not educated. Now this is not always the case. And this lends to the often paternalistic solutions given to combat food insecurity, instead of the ingrained structural violence and deliberateness of creating food, quote unquote, disadvantaged and vulnerable community members. The pandemic is widening the poverty food insecurity gap as black indigenous and racial, racialized workers are being laid off, losing income at higher rates. Food prices are on the rise. People are not always able to order food online or pay for basic food necessities due to anti-black racism, black debt and limited loan forgiveness and or even access to loans. Not having credit or credit being decreased is also happening. The impact of COVID-19 is more intense on black people who are living through food violence uh, experience of higher rates of COVID due to exposure through precarious work, our overrepresentation among essential workers, and having limited government supports. SERBs and its stipulations don't cover undoc undocumented folks. They were not included in this, in this package. This has left the pandemic response to be framed as individual choice, led by mainly middle class white men and women with no surveillance on those with unearned privileges. This has resulted in the notion for many that COVID 19 and intersectional violence, including food security, it it is not their problem, and it is a very racialized problem. I'll end there, I think. Thank you very much, Roberta, um, for that. And, and just just so you, um, we just got to know um, for you to slow down just a bit for the ASL interpreters. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but that was beautiful. <laughs> I will. And I think, I, I think, I think one thing that's very important um, for folks on 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 this. Um, event tonight is to understand that a lot of the problems that um, folks face in the food system is pre-existing problem that have been exacerbated by COVID-19. And, and there's a lot of stats that are coming out recently um, to kind of to, to, to show what has been existing. Um, these are not new, um, new problems. Um, Soraya, do you want, do you want to maybe speak on this? So hi, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for organizing this. Yes, uh, like you mentioned, it's not new. It's just uh, coming out on the surface, um, and it just, uh, it's old. Like, it, yeah, I'm, I'm sometimes I get wonder where I'm living, um, and the, we have all kind of research uh, done here and there, and focus groups, and all kind of evidence out there, and the way we measure the country by the people who are successful. And like really, um, and forget the people who are really need help and making them invisible in, in the community. Um, right now, it's COVID. It just makes it put it on the surface. This is not new, and we are doing all kind of stuff to uh, overcome the challenge that exists because there is already red tape everywhere that you're trying to help the people who are less fortunate. And, and they are not on the table to advocate for them. They are working precarious job. And, and how, how do you include them? And who is absent on the table? The people who are really need support. Um, and decision is making behind the scene that impact the people who are really um, vulnerable, I would say. And really, uh, when we say equity seeking, no, equity deserving people. Um, and the way we frame the language, I think we need to uh, think about and, and, and making them to feel sorry. Um, and it, it's sad, unfortunately. And after research, after research, um, the, the way we frame the language and we making them victimize and the make, making them feel sorry that they already are going through a lot of mental health 
um, they are already suffering um, physically. And because if you are not getting nutrition that you need, you're supposed to be getting, and you cannot function 100%, and you, they expect you to be in that table, this table, um, it, it just it doesn't add up. And the people who are making a decision are people who are privileged already. Um, and it just, um, I get frustrated always thinking about food insecurity, um, social justice, uh, when we talk about um, in the community who are really uh, impacted by um, all kinds of uh, institution um, barrier that, that exists, that um, instead of removing, and we seeing what right now is we see the surface of the people are sleeping on the street. Really, this what makes it okay? As the big like developed country that we say people are in this cold, people are sleeping on the street. Shame on us! I would say, I, I think we could reflect on ourselves and say that this is not okay. And it will take all of us to say this is not okay. And we need to make the government accountable, and that why people are dying on the street on the winter why people are going hungry. Like this, all of the questions that it will make us wonder and make us think twice and we shouldn't be sleeping. And peacefully, then when we see the people who are sleeping on the streets, this is not okay. Um, I just, um, yeah, that's uh, my, my two cents and I just get um, very angry to talk about this. Yeah, yes, yeah, for sure. Like yeah. knowing all the injustices that happen in this world, um, it is only in value that we're angry about um, a lot of things happening. Um, Surya, I know that you do a lot of work in, in the Regent Park community and the surrounding areas. Could you tell us a bit more about kind of like some of the some of the gaps that existed in the community in terms of food access? Um, and, and how has that changed and what's the dynamic in, um, in, in the community right now during the COVID-19 pandemic? So yeah, it, people are were ex working in precarious job in one working on daycare or support in lunchroom as supervisor or having a part-time job so they could be with their kids. Um, those are impacted by the COVID. It, that, that opportunity doesn't exist. Um, and that impact the, kid, the teenager. And you wonder why we have a gun violence, why we have a drug, why the kids are like killing each other. Like we, we need to think about it because we are not doing prevention stuff, we're just reacting. And what are we doing for those youth? Are we helping them after school program? Is there employment for them, uh, for, uh, for those teenagers? Is there after school program that makes them succeed? Um, is there uh, is the teacher that we are hiring on those neighborhood, uh, do they care for those kids? We need to ask our question. It takes all of us that the whole circle that we need to examine. Is this uh, access to recreation, access to the swimming, access to the, the community center? Is this accessible for the kids who are really needed? Um, and it just, um, there is beautiful building but at the same time, we need to examine, is it accessible for those kids who are really needed? Is there a job for those young people? Um, and all of that, it will come and back and to hunt them and think about how many kids from Regent Park, they are in jail. Is this okay? How many indigenous kids are in, in jail? It is, this is another way of slavery. If we if we just thinking about it, if, we, if some of folks in, in, in the people who are comfortable, we don't talk about it. And we need to talk about the gun violence. The root cause, the root cause of the gun violence is poverty. And why the kids aren't being targeted in those neighborhoods. Why there is a gun? Why is, why is the drugs? Why the kids are dying on the streets? And why don't we speak about it? And why the media is not covering? We need to question all of those angles. This is not OK. And it will take all of us to speak about this. It's a social issue that we have. In other countries, they all overcome that, this kind of challenge. And I think we need to examine and the way we are doing, and we need to think about prevention mechanisms that we need to put. When something happened, we just rush um, and react on it, and nothing happened after that. And someone else is going to die again. 
Mm. Um, and I will, we had um, last week the day of action to prevent gun violence. And it was 150 people showed up. We planned it within five days. And it, touching east, west, north, south, the gun violence everywhere, where the neighborhood improvement area, Toronto community housing, majority of them, the kids were dying. Um, we need to think about what is it, what's went wrong? Why are the kids are dying? Why is why there is no impactful programming that we are supposed to be doing? Um, the food mm -hmm. insecurity, it's like, yeah, it, it is gonna get worse. Yeah, we thank you, sir, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tracy Ann, um, I, I just I wanted to to pose like kind of the second question, and I, I know, you, and you can speak about it together because many of us who get our food from the stars um, may not have the perspective of of workers who produce the food. Um, can you speak on the challenges faced by the workers who work from planting to harvesting and packaging of the food we get from our grocery stores? And not just the harsh working conditions, but living conditions and the lack of a pathway to gaining permanent residence um, or status in Canada. Like, how is their health and how is their well being um, being impacted even during this time? Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for um, allowing me to be on this platform. As a migrant worker, you are, treat, you are not treated or protected from bully bosses. And the working environment is not of the standard. Imagine you leave your country and came to Canada taking care of Canadian by ensuring that they have vegetables on their tables. And yet still, as we as migrant workers, we are not being treated fairly. As a previous migrant workers, my expectation was very high because I thought that Canada was a country that protect everyone equal, that protect everyone equally and treat us as migrant workers with respect and justice. But sadly to say, I was wrong. Injustice and racism is very high right here in Canada and discrimination. We have to be doing the dirty and disgusting job that the Canadian has refused to do. And yet still, we even get a comfortable environment to relax, to sleep after a 10 or 16 days shift at work. We have to be living in a home that has up to 20 persons in an open space without any doors or privacy. Having about 200 or more persons living in a bunkhouse, sharing three bathroom, or even have only two cooking stoves. After being working in a dangerous environment, having to deal with equipment that are not safe, exposed to chemical, that can cause diseases, have to work in the sun, outside, and even the cold, having to deal with some bully bosses or supervisor working extra long hours and still not able to get access to a relaxing and comfortable housing to get a proper rest. Some of the challenges that migrant, face, migrant worker face when they get injured, they send them packing immediately. Sometimes you wonder if they are working with the airline. As a migrant worker, even in that moment, the bosses will still push you hard to work in the same speed as you were working before, because we are working and treated like a robot machine. Are we not allowed to get injured or sick? they will quickly make arrangements for us to go back home and said that someone else is there waiting for that spot. Firstly, I will adjust the COVID waiver 
wavering that are signed relieve government from liability. Some persons may say why they still come on the program, especially in this pandemic. But the truth is, they don't have a choice. Imagine you're in your country, you don't have any, you're looking for a job, you don't have any, any job. And so you have to come here to able to take care of your family as you're not able to eat anything. So as migrant workers, they have to, they have to make that big choice. They have to make that decision to come here and work and so they can able to take care of their family. Unfortunately, my, my, Tracy, you still there? Okay, I think we may have lost Tracy um, due to maybe connection. Oh, okay, Tracy, are you back? You can continue. Thank you. Did you finish off what you wanted to? Um, okay, yeah, awesome. Um, I, th I think this is this is very important to know that again, like this is happening in Canada and we have a problem of wanting to hush and hide and pretend that these things aren't happening in Canada. And for folks who want to kind of learn more about the reality and see like video, you know, footage of like how the conditions of what people are living in, there, there's a documentary called Migrant um, Dreams that folks can 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 see and, and see the reality of, of folks who make the food that we eat um, possible. Like they, they literally work hard for, for that food to be on our table and they're not even being treated um, as humans. The next question we have here is, is, is kind of the mainstream media laments about the loss of business and closure of city bars, um, restaurants, and many which are well established. Um, what do we know about of the small grassroots kitchen enterprises, like the ones run by immigrant women, and whose primary source of income um, and community may have been shut off? Um, Soraya, I know you work very much in community. Could you could you tell us some of uh, of the initiatives that may have existed um, in the community to support um, folks, immigrants, and 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 women in the community um, that may have been affected by the COVID nineteen pandemic? Sure. Yeah. Um, so the like you mentioned, the food in industry is really hit by the COVID. Um, so one of the things that um, in Region Park success that we had was the catering collectives. And on the top of that, we were uh, getting a space to have dedicated commercial kitchen for uh, Region Park Catering Collective. That was under construction, but we couldn't fundraise. Um, so we let it go of that space. Um, it, it's tight to fundraise uh, for the kitchen uh, as well. So all of the, uh, the ladies who are part of the Catering Collective were really, really impacted by uh, loss of uh, making making food and not having opportunities. Um, it was very sad to see, and, and I really um, this was a success for, for Region Park. Um, we trained more than about more than three hundred uh, community members, the partners with public health, to have their food handling certificate, and it, will, it opened a lot of opportunities. Otherwise, they won't get opportunities because of the experience, because of the language barrier. This was, uh, it was amazing uh, opportunities, but the COVID really hits um, all of them. Um, but one thing that people were reaching out through my contact and how can we help? Um, and for those families who are really impacted by this. And I, be, I was delivering during, especially during COVID and buying um, a fresh gift card and delivering those families, uh, those gift cards. Um, over the about 
3,000. This was before the government to step in. Um, and I was delivering and nobody was knowing and, and other than the people who donate the money to because people were afraid of leaving the house. People were afraid of the virus, like you're gonna die. I remember one of the lady like, you are not afraid of your life. Why are you going out? She said like, like people need help. The people need our help. Someone has to step in to do the work. Um, so I was delivering the, the, the gift cards um, and buying a fresh gift card to those, those families. Um, unfortunately, um, yeah, the food was really hit by COVID. Um, those is, they were supporting their, um, the whole families on, on this as well. And some of them working as I mentioned as a lunchroom supervisor and all of them are gone. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Dr. Roberta, um, I just wanted to, to come back to the previous question as well. Um, and also to, to carry on what Soraya had talked about in terms of like the impact of, of COVID-19 directly on, on community initiatives. Like how are, how, can you paint a picture of like how community members um, may be affected in terms of our health and, and mental health too specifically around like initiatives that existed to support community members that, that may have been shut down or, or discontinued um, due, to the, due to the pandemic? Hi Hansel, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just wanna say that I, I, I feel very connected to Tracy and to Soraya also because I, I grew up in Galloway and Scarborough uh, metro housing community um, I also have cousins who, my mom came here as a domestic worker. I have cousins who were migrant workers here who were not able to stay. And I just want to mention the, 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 the little bit of the history before I get to the question you asked me. Um, you know, it's really important to understand that there was an African immigration ban. Um, the 1867, 1867 to 1960s ban of African immigration to Canada after the Slavery, the slavery Abolition Act of 1833. And this indicates the connection of black migrant workers, domestic workers to plantation-like conditions to enter Canada, even in, the, in 2020. So how you know, African folks after that ban could get into Canada was through domestic worker work or migrant work. And that, that really shapes you know, what's happening right now in 2020. Um, in terms of the mental and physical health impact on, on African Caribbean laborers, as well as Latin American ones, is that they are at risk and dying from COVID-19. There's, there's a risk for, for people's lives. Moreover, these plantation-like conditions continue to create food surplus for middle class and elites in Canada and globally, while signing inhumane liability contracts, which is the, the waiver, um, that criminalizes them and threatens their lives. And this is a human rights violation and an act of colonial violence. So I just wanted to, to say that before I, I answer the, the other question. So the, the impact of food violence, um, mental and physical health, is, is several, several things. As we said, it's happened since before COVID-19 and now it's intensified. So there's increased anxiety in terms of you know, how you're getting food, where you're getting food, increased depression within the community. Um, it is very challenging you know, trying to, to put food on the table when you don't have money or you've lost your job. There's isolation that happens also because you know, folks are not, not all folks are telling people what actually is happening and how they're living. Um, there's also trauma. Food violence is traumatic. It is, you know, you're, you're, you're physically and mentally traumatized by not having the ability to, to have food. Uh, I also want to bring up maternal health problems. You know, there are folks who are uh, dealing with reproductive rights, Black women, Indigenous women, who already have been dealing with um, the impact of anti-Black racism and maternal health rights. And now with the, with the increase of food violence and not having access to good foods during COVID and job loss, et cetera, and even housing insecurities, uh, you know, uh, I, I'd like to check what are, what's happening with our maternal health problems and, and the rates in terms of our, our Black women in our community. Um, there's also the chronic health flare-ups and detrimental health outcomes. We know we have high rates of diabetes in the community, high blood pressure, um, uh, higher HIV prevalence, cancer, you know, and, and heart health issues. And we know these issues are directly related to the impact of anti-Black racism and transgenerational trauma. And um, so not having food or the right to food can lead to death to our community members. And it's a really important, I think, connection. You know, there are some grass, grass uh, root kitchens who, grassroot kitchens who have been shut down and many were forced to seek um, 
unemployment or social assistance, but there are folks who are undocumented, who don't have money, who weren't documented initially, and uh, they're, they're, they're struggling, you know, people who are having to um, hop houses or hop couches and don't have the means to have food or, or, or housing. So um, if you look at the structures of the governmental structures um, for, you know, businesses, we know that there's a problem. That in many ways, this has to do with the blatant anti-Black racism and violence that occurs when trying to get a business loan in Canada in general even if you have citizenship and you have your papers. There are other grassroots kitchens who are hustling and they're open and community members continue to support them. I wanna give a shout out to um, Sunny Boy Farm, to Black Creek Community Farm, to uh, Bashir Mounier, who's doing some amazing programs for, for African folks in the community. You know, So there are community members who are starting their new, new ventures and, and selling products through word of mouth. There's a little girl I know in the, in the community who, who um, is selling plantain chips. Uh, they're really good too, let me tell you. I've had a little too many. And, you know, so folks are trying to resist against this food violence, but with, they have, you know, really, 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 really difficult challenges. But I also want to put up the resistance because we also are resisting. And, you know, there, there's many ways to do that. And we can talk a little bit more about, about that when we talk about the next questions about what can we do and how do we actually decolonize the food industry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Roberta, for that. I, I think it is very important to, to, basically honor the the folks in the community who are doing a lot of great work especially in the food space um i'd be honored to work with a lot of them and and it's also important for for folks to know even the a lot of the information that we're starting to get um research and the studies that are being done about how COVID-19 is impacting different communities is also pushed by a lot of black um, organizations and organizers in the community. Like the, the, the recent study that showed that um, black Torontonians, even if just accounting 9% of the population, we're 23 um, points, we're 23% of the COVID-19 cases in Toronto. So there's just many <laughs> things that we, you know, that we don't know and a lot of organizers are, are, are pushing, pushing for better um, um, in, um, for us in our communities. Um, the next question says, in, in a recent report by Foodshare and Proof, it shows Black households are 3.56 times more likely to be food insecure than a white household. In your opinion, is the government doing enough to address the food crisis within communities um, and groups that are most impacted by food insecurity? And what actions um, and integrated approach can we take towards food insecurity? Um, so anyone could go first um, with this question. Um, as a black community, there are so many people today who are insecure about running out of food to eat, to feed their children or their family. They go for the whole day without, without, um, without eating anything. Some even limit the amount they normally eat so they could have food for the next day. They have to compromise their quality due to lack of money for food. Suffering from food insecurity can cause hunger, which can lead to sickness and diseases and death. If not getting the right nutrient for the body so that it can function properly. In this, um, some person cannot get access to government financial assistance because they are not Canadian citizens. Status in Canada bar you from not able to get any form of support, financial support. Even um, as migrant worker, it's hard for them um being separated from their families especially during this time some of them they are not allowed to leave the farm if they leave the farm the employer will fire them we as a community group justice for migrant workers have to be reaching out to workers who are complaining about not having 
enough food to eat and some volunteer have to step in so they can could able to assist them. Ensuring that community residents have access to enough healthy, safe food through a sustainable food system that man maximizes community self realization and social justice and con continue to lobby the government to acknowledge the fact that the Black community is at disadvantages when it comes to food security and healthcare. Thank you, Tracy. Um, Soraya, can you can you tell us like what role do you think the government should play in in kind of in ensuring food security in different communities and and just like taking a takes um, um a case study of, of Regent Park community like what could change what could the government do better um on all level what's their role in in, in that? So uh, that's a very good question. If we look at the history, so when the white immigrant came to the Canada and how is how do, do they had land access to the land it was given the grant and plus the land was given to them actually was given to them they stole the land um the grant to the government was given them the land the grant to them so I think as um citizen we need to make the government accountable and advocate if they are going to make a change, a policy change, or are they gonna willing to work on this cause because there is a lot of suffering that's happening. Why don't the black people not, not owning the land? Why don't they own the farm? Like this is the time that we need to have conversation because there is anti-black racism that, that's happening right now. All institutions, they need to advocate and stand up and make a change. Then we need to make all the level of the government, they need to speak about this. And they need to have the black community, they need to have access to the land and access to the farm. So why look at the history, how that those generation, they had access to it. And because they know how to advocate or they stole the land, we will say, um, but there is a lot of land that, that, that exists. Why don't black community not have access to that land and the farm? And this is a time if we want to advocate, if we want to change, if this is a time that all of us, we need to make all the government and we need to make them accountable and ask them where they stand on this. And if we want to free ourselves, if we want to if we want to free our black communities, this is the time we need to speak up. Not only tokenism and really, and when I'm at BC, there is a movement that's happening and, and everywhere that you would just put a black people in the front and that's it, everybody's, they will shut up. That's not the real change that need to, we need to talk about. We need to examine them and making them accountable also. Are you doing a lip service or are we doing a tokenism and putting those black people on the front and not, fo not following up or not making a ch policy change that needs really meaningful change, systematic change that we need to talk about it. And all of us, this we need to advocate. And if we don't do it, it will, we're gonna cry out, out like our kids will, will pay for this. I'm just gonna, I'm just putting that out. And it's, a, we need to think about twice how we need our elective representative need to be make them accountable. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for that, Soraya. It is important for us to to hold those who are at the front of, of, of movements and like work that needs to be done in our community accountable. Um, Dr. Roberta, what do you, what can that, what does that approach look like? What, what can, what is the role of the government in that approach and also the, the role of community members um, within that approach of, of you know, working towards a more food secure um, communities in, in, in Canada? Okay. Um, well, the, of course the government is not doing enough to address the food crisis. We have enough food in this country. I, I wanna say that we have enough food in the country and the government is pur purposely hoarding food and creating deprivation for black community members. So this is not an accident that this is being done. And I think the history and the current day uh, conversations we have are saying this. I still can't get over the amount of grocery stores in this country and food is thrown out rather than giving it for free or at a lower cost to people on a daily basis. 
So, so looking at actions on, in terms of integrating our approach, approach need to address food violence, I think you know, the, the movement is continuing to look at decolonizing the food industry, decolonizing urban planning, because how urban planning is done is critical in terms of uh, how food disparities in certain neighborhoods are. I grew up in a neighborhood that had more McDonald's, more Wendy's, more fast food restaurants, and we couldn't find a fresh, you know, there was not a fresh food option or local community butcher. My mom had to go far to, to, to find that, and uh, we, we didn't even have the means to do that. I also grew up in a neighborhood or neighborhoods who didn't even have grass to grow gardens, right? So the urban planning that is done is purposeful. It's done in a reason to keep people from being food secure. So we have to question those pieces. Is the government able to, to do that? Are they going to give us, you know, just like nicely give us um, opportunities or food? No. So it's going to have to be, of course, the, the protest, the, the accountability and, and trying to hold people accountable or responsible for, for these types of actions. Um, we have to provide folks with good food at low cost, provide folks with more than a living wage because a living wage is, is critical in terms of how we buy the food, provide more affordable and stable and good housing. We know that even within the, in the housing community or the Toronto community housing, there's a lot of housing conditions that are not okay uh, for people to live in. Uh, we have to give resources to black communities to coordinate food sharing. I actually believe in health reparations. When I talk a lot about health reparations, food insecurity and food violence has to do with health reparations. Uh, the reparations for African enslavement and the impact of anti-black racism and our health disparities, we have to demand that we actually get health reparations, which is a part of uh, the food justice conversation for me. And I think that we are owed resources to deal with food insecurities in our community. And we're not gonna get them just by standing. We're gonna get them by yelling. We're gonna get them by protesting. We're getting them by having forums like this to demand that we, um, you know, we have food security because we know that within a white supremacist system and a colonial system, they're never just gonna give it to us. This is what creates the system and what maintains the system is the impoverishment of black bodies. So um, a part of the government response has never been okay. And we have to demand and fight for a better response. Thank you, Dr. Roberta. Um, yeah, it, it is. It, it's a very, I think one one key thing that you've you've brought to light is is the conversation or the need to understand um, that food security and the fight for food the the food justice movement or the fight for 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 better food and clean food for all is beyond just access to food but it's, it includes our health it includes um, poverty it includes job security it includes like having living wages um, there's so much to talk about in 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 all this conversation and it, it makes me think Tracy Ann tell tell us about like what it means as a, as a migrant worker who, or former migrant worker who like growing the food, but not even earning enough to buy the food. Like what, can, can you tell us about that? Yes, so you have um, migrant workers, they are, um, they are doing the work um preparing the food and yet still i can i'm not saying they can't buy the food but yes they can't even take some of the things that they are helped to produce they can't take it right. or even if they take it they have to take the worst the one that you will throw in the garbage you know so sometimes when i look at that and remember um when even if you said to the supervisor that if you could able to get some, they will tell you you have to take um you have to take the second number two, like the one near to the garbage. We'll call it number two. So it's hard for them um can't able to to buy food, especially when they when they um because for me, I think the government they 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 wasn't prepared for them, cause for them to come up. And they have to they have to um, quarantine for two weeks, and yet still no one is not ensuring that they are getting a proper meal to eat. How can they allow them to come up here to do job, and yet still they are not preparing for them to able to eat? They 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 don't have any form of income to buy any food, or they cannot leave the leave the place to even buy food. So for me, that was really sad 
And um, I think they need to look into that. So if they're not able, they need to look into just that and adjust the system. Because for me, I see um, this pandemic, even though it's bad, but in the sense with the farm workers, they, it helped to expose a lot of things that was happening years after years. So this um, pandemic was able to expose what was hiding because for me, I think a lot of them, they know what's happening, but they put a blind eye to it. So this pandemic, um, so, so of everything that is happening. And as a community, um, we all have to work together so that we can able to demand justice and able to um, demand changes for them. And even for the next generation, Thank you. So, so that that really leads into into my next question of, of what can we do um, as students, as individuals, and in, in organizations to address systemic inequality, um, generally and also in in food spaces and and within the food movement or the food space, and and also support those who are most affected um, by these problems. Anyone um, can go first. Okay, I will just do my little last last piece. Um, so migrant workers, um, they are trying to fight back, but they can't do it without all of us who are in this platform and those who are watching. They they need everyone so that we can able to um, demand changes to the government law. Um, changes um, I would like to see, or changes they would like to see um, that migrant workers would be able to provide quality health care regarding, um, regarding their status or even in their health, if their health care coverage is expired. Because a lot of migrant workers, when they got injured on the job, they are not allowed to get treatment. They send them back home. And for me, that is not fair. That is injustice because when you're coming on the program, you have to go through medical um, examination before you can enter into the, um, come on the program. So you are coming up here 100%. Why is it you're coming up here 100% and you want to send me back home 40%? So, um, so we we that um, changes that I would like to see is that government should implement a system to ensure ensure that um, migrant workers is not lack of food to eat and can be able to access to fin financial support by ensuring that proper healthcare guidelines proper health health guideline in work or at home. Sanitize is being made and that accountability will be ex accountability will be exclude, excluded and employer being exposed for not providing a safe environment. Changes I would like to see done is that migrant worker will receive permanent resident upon arrival. You have a lot of persons that are coming here over 15 years. They made that choice and they come and they separate from their family and they come and they work and they are paying taxes. And yet still, they're not able to stay in the country, even to enjoy, even to get some of their, um, the money that they have been paying for the, over the years. And even um, there have been lack of overtime. So those are some of the changes. So changes, um, and, and for me, um, especially the farm workers who are right here in Canada, who are working in this pandemic, 
I believe that they would able to get the chance to receive permanent residence. Okay, as I close, uh, as I close, no matter where you are from and what your status might be, we also be treat, treated fairly with respect and have equal rights. These should be determined that it's okay to neglect the safety of migrant workers. As the year is almost ended, I hope to see changes that for the upcoming year on the program and everyone right now in this moment can start to make this change by helping us to speak out about our demands. Tell a friend, tell a neighbor about the injustice that migrant workers are facing. That starts, that is a big start. Ensuring that even when elections come, you mark the X at the right spot. Um, other ways um, that you can even make change, um, help to support migrant worker is by help them with non-personal food items because it's so hard for them, especially now, because you know the world is experienced the same thing um, where you lost your job, you're not able to do the, um, the hours that you normally do. So and for migrant workers, if you don't work, you're not gonna get paid. It's not the, like they have any other source of income. So they have to work. And sometimes it's so hard because by the time you you pay, you get your paid and you go, you have to send home money home for, to take care of your family. You don't even have any for yourself. And a lot of them, they come on the program and they leave that at home because when you're coming on the program, you have to go through a lot of examination. And some of the time you have to even borrow money from other persons so that and said, okay, I'm gonna come up. So when I come up and I work, I will give it back to you. But now they are in debt too. Um, financial, financial support. Because a lot of migrant workers, when a lot of migrant workers, um, they are trying to fight back, especially when they got fired for not doing, for standing up for their rights. Um, a lot of them, they, they are even when they get injured and they want to stay to get um, treatment, they don't have anywhere to stay. And because of that, they just, go home so um for me i would like to see that changes where um, some preparation could be made so that if they decide or to fight or if they decide um to make a stand that they have somewhere i have support um toilet streets and assist with struggling um that um migrant workers are are experience okay that's it thank you very much jc i think accountability is is an important conversation um in in all this it, holding the government accountable um is 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 definitely extremely important tracy did you ha have something to add yes i just remember something Yes, um, as you talk about the accountability, because um, for me, um, knowing that, um, especially what's happening with the pandemic, and yes, still um, some some persons have to die. Persons have to die for for them to make that change. That's really sad, because from the moment we all know that um, uh, social distance and. If you're letting them come um, on the program, they should have already made that change to ensure that mm -hmm. their workplace is safe, that they have certain amount of persons in one little space. Because if that's why you have a lot of outbreak, because if you have that little space 
and you have so many persons. They don't have any, it's just a little tiny space. They don't have any um, room to leave space for social distance. And it was really heartbroken to know that in this time that um, it could be prevented and persons have to, um, persons have to die for them to really see that they need to make a change in that. So in this case, um, COVID has really so, so of um, um, what's this happening. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and I know I read in the Toronto Star that even after the deaths of, of, of some migrant workers on the farm due to lack of social distancing measures, um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the federal government, even after um, put in $50 million um, into, into the two, farm, <laughs> two farmers to ensure that these measures are implemented in and on the farms and in residence quarters for, for, the, for the workers, they're still not doing that. Like, it's, 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 it's sad. Um, the government needs to do more work on, on holding those employees accountable. In fact, I want to see the money go to migrant workers. Um, yeah, so Dr. Roberta, please, please tell us like what, what um, and the question is like, what can we do as students and individuals and organizations, you know, right. to, to address this inequality and, and, and hold the parties accountable? Thank you. Well, continue doing work, the, the, the amazing work that Tracy's doing, you know, is, is one example. Keep on doing the work. Um, we need to advocate for policy change and direct programming and fundraising. We need to create community food sharing initiatives, bartering food system, because folks are doing it right now. We need to be a little bit more organized about it. We need to go back to the kind of each one teach one principle regarding how to grow gardens and other sustainable foods and herbs in any space, including apartments. You know, people are growing tomatoes and, and things, and how do we actually get that those, those pieces done. Uh, we need to share resources with people and organizations that are doing resistance work, empowering people to thrive even in challenging situations because we're in the situation. If we wait for the government, we, we were, we're all gonna be food insecure, you know, because it, it's a part of the government's plan, but we need to continue to resist. We need to broaden our understanding of food violence as emancipatory work and as a part of reparations work, as I said earlier. And I'm just gonna, my last point is that if you have a little bit more, you give to another sister or brother who does not have. Work like a village and pay it forward. If I if that wasn't done for me, I wouldn't be here today. That's how my family lived, and we passed it on to other folks. And I'm and I'm doing it today. And I and I hope that we can continue as a village to do that for others. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. Um, Sarah, please please tell us like what can what can we do in in, in our communities to? Well, yeah. Um... I just the last point that that what I heard is very reflecting and like the place where I come from Ethiopia nobody get no one go hungry like I'm, I'm, I'm I get shocked sometimes where I am and nobody no one get hungry it takes all of us to support and 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 look to each other and support those who are nobody will actually nobody is looking down upon the people who doesn't afford or who doesn't have nothing we lift them and we feed them, we house them. And, and it's just, we became individual societies. There is no such, such thing as individual society, but we became individual here. And that's why you think there's a lot of social issues that we have. We are not capable of solving it, but we have a lot of resource that could go around. We hogging them and we need to look into ourselves and realize our privilege as well. In the school, there is a lot of resource advocacy team and uh, petition, all kind of campaign and fundraising. We all have different skills and, and we let's make sure that nobody goes hungry and advocate the people who are less fortunate than us and who are really deserve equity, not seeking equity. I, I don't like the, the, the language that they use, deserving equity that we need to advocate. They deserve our advocacy. And we need to use our privilege all on shape of that we have it in, in riots. And there is a lot of resource that that you guys are capable of doing. This is one of them. It's beautiful that you guys came up to do this and continue to do this. Not just one time off, continue until we make a change. And let's make sure that nobody's going hungry. And let's make sure that we make the government accountable. 
yes, it will, it will take time, the government resource until we kick in, but as the individual, we could do so much. And I will end there. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Soraya, and, and thank you to all our panelists today, Dr. Roberta, Tracy, and, and Soraya. Thank you all for, for being a part of this panel tonight. Um, so to everyone, we've, we've, we've heard it from, from them on how we can, we can do better as individuals in the system and also parts of a whole of organizations and, and, and systems that we, we, we might be part of. And, and also understanding the privilege we might hold in any any social um, location that we might find ourselves in, um, and, and using that to to do the little work or the much work we can do. Um, thank you all very much for being here, and I will go ahead to um, kind of just call out all the demands that Caesar um, has um, right now. These are the current demands. So a free and accessible education for all um, with increased targets, grants, and bursaries for indigenous, black, and racialized students. The recognition and implementation of Orange Shirt Day province-wide and campus-wide. Defund the police and cops off campus. The implementation and prioritization of specialized programs. Decent work, decent pay on campus and in our communities more black and indigenous faculty, teachers and staff, removal of Ergotin virus and statue, um, the implementation of race-based data province-wide, more services, programs and supports for black and indigenous students. And for those who might wanna learn more about this demands and see what Caesar is doing um, concerning this demands, you can go on the website. Um, thank you.